Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back. It's League Unlock here. Again, Mark here with you for another little countdown special. This one is a, an homage, a shout out to the fans who have been around for almost a decade. And it's, it's a new year we're entering and Mark's got a new T1 hoodie to represent the boys as we count down and rank every jungler in the history of T1 and SKT. I'm an, I'm an easy target for the Christmas gifts. You know you just got to go onto the T1shop.com, pick yourself up something nice. I opened that one, and I knew it. Saving it for the first T1-themed episode of the comeback, and here we are, day two, right into it, and we're going to take a time, a trip, looking back through one of the most impactful roles of the T1 organization, of course, excluding just Faker in the mid lane, holding down that position for so long. We're talking about that other part of the equation, that mid jungle, talking about them jungle. And probably the most scrutinized and criticized position in the professional scene, because it's always, if T1 isn't performing, who's almost always the first position people are blaming? Because you know it ain't Faker, and just like in solo queue, blame the jungle first. It's just like Solo Q. It's always going to be the jungler. And you look at the T1 equation, a lot of the times, obviously, Faker, and you're bringing in a very high caliber ADC along into that equation. You know, there was a long, you know, a couple years where you're talking about the top lane priority, all these type of things. But of course, as you said, it is always that first finger that is pointed out is at the jungler. These guys, you look through them. There's some that have some longevity staying with T1, staying with SKT and making sure that that is their history. There's other guys that are one and done, but they're hitting pretty good to get themselves a spot on this list. And we start with the guys who maybe don't have a big enough body of work to warrant getting an actual ranking. So we group a trio of them together. And initially you might say, uh, guys, you got the list wrong. Wolf didn't play jungle for SKT, but... If you are an OG fan, you're going to the dark days of 2018. He did suit up for four games as their starting jungler. He ended up going two and two. This is when it was a complete mess for SKT because they were trying anything. They were trying anything. They were trying to figure out any other way to stay above water in that situation that year. Wolf Jungle was not the expected life raft that it was going to be. As you said, still two and one record. But no, even in those two wins, you're not looking at any type of real Oh my God, this is the momentum we're building around this. None of those type of situations does find himself that honorable mention with those games played on this type of list. The other one, of course, Blossom, maybe not the, the highest. Same surprise. year, that was the other thing they were trying. <laughs> Looking back at T1, Palm is the other one that comes through and a lot of people are going, oh yes, the draft mastermind. Let me hear about this one. My man was pretty hot playing back in the day for T1, picking up a pretty good record himself. 15 and two. As that starting jungler for T1, you know, he came into that lineup in 2015 as he was pegged as kind of an Udyr one trick. And then this is the crazy split where Tom subs in for Bangi in finals against the GE Tigers alongside Easy Hoon. They have two basically subs and they proceed to 3-0 the finals. Yeah, uh, nothing but the business as usual for the 2015 SKT run through. That was that year, the domination that they showed. Tom, a nice little footnote into that one. I'm sure a lot of the T1 fans a little bit more happy and proud and fulfilled with the latest accomplishment from Tom for the T1 organization. Yeah, legacy definitely going to be more remembered as uh, that coach and draft god and Blossom, as you mentioned. Unfortunately, the lasting memory most people are going to have from him is... He was the master Yi to Faker's Taric mid lane that we've all tried to forget. Yeah, blacking that one out of the mind. I know a lot of people are going to look through and, and, you know, kind of always in the trivia section looking through the different champions that Faker has played and, they, and they'll identify that Taric. And that's the one. Blossom's little extra note into history is as that master Yi. Then after that, we can get to the actual rankings here. Guys that played upwards of, you know, at least a whole split or 40 plus games. And the obvious one to start with is Mr. Elam, who showed glimpses. You thought maybe this guy was going to be the future jungle spot for T1 in 2020 spring. They were looking good. Things looked like this team was back on track. And then... Obviously, we ended up getting a whole lot of roster shuffling going on, not just with the jungle, but pretty much everybody except for Kyria in that 2020 era. 
and I think that's one of those situations where you can look back at Elam and his performances and look at some of the highs. You can identify some of the gameplay on things like Trundle had a pretty darn good win percentage on that. The Olaf as well was another champion that I think came through and was strong for him during that period. Again, like for a lot of other junglers at that time. And then you enter into the musical chair situation for T1 that we had going on. I don't think A, individually, he did enough to solidify, to stand out for himself, to be one that would be a centerpiece to stick in after, you know, the musical chairs act ended for T1. And he certainly was someone that I think was affected by that situation with that instability, with those constant changes going around, finds himself in this type of position. Still a good serviceable time for T1. Obviously, when you're talking about an organization with the rich history and the highs of highs that T1 has, this is not going to be enough to cut yourself higher into a list like this. And want to set the caveat here for this list going forward. We're looking specifically at their time on T1. It doesn't matter what happened before, what happened after they were on this organization. We're looking specifically at the bodies of work for when they were playing with the most icon iconic organization. Elam goes on to the Kwangdong Freaks after T1 and... You know, maybe never exactly lives up to the hype, but with Closer getting subbed in, you had Guma getting subbed in for Teddy. It was a mess across the board. And the one guy who eventually stole that starting spot from Elam was Cuz, the old Wiley veteran. And I know people, he definitely got his share of flame while he was on T1, but even at this number six spot, you start seeing that these guys had incredibly high highs because... Cuz still picked up a finals MVP on T1. Yes, he did. So that is going well for him. Instantly gets that step up above someone like Elam. And then you look at the performances, the gameplay. Yes, there are a couple, more than a couple, I'll be fair. Downturns, <laughs> down moments that you could look at and, and kind of pinpoint and criticize for Cuz during his stay with T1. But you look at a lot of the positives, a lot of the angles, a lot of the way that he pressured and put together that pace and pushed this T1 team to be a little bit more proactive absolutely looking at him and having that impactful role and position for T1 during his time as jungle. He brought stability during this roster chaos. Unfortunately, the stability was often short-lived. It came in stints. He's, he's just more of a sprinter than a marathon runner. He's, he's a streaker. He's a man who gets on those hot streaks. He gets on that cold streak. That's the way it goes for someone like Cuz. We've seen it extend beyond the T1 era where he has been able to find success, get into those type of hot streaks. That is the type of player that Cuz was with T1, that type of form that's that we saw from this year with KT. That was a lot of those type of cheering moments, exactly the same that we saw back when he was with T1. And I know I just said we're looking specifically at T1, but I think most people would have thought post T1, Cuz was going to be washed up and be on a middling tier in the LCK and just fade into the darkness. But actually had his best year maybe ever on KT Rolser following that run on T1. So he was in that hyperbolic chamber where every single click is heavily scrutinized by the community that he suffered under T1 and was able to survive and bounce back. Ugh. Number five on this list. I, I gotta just do a huge sigh because talk about scrutiny. I'm gonna say it. The most flamed player in the history of T1 is blank. It's Agent 612, and because this guy's three years, he was part of that jungling core for T1. Yes, he was often splitting time with Peanut, with Bangi, or with Blossom and Wolf in 2018, but the start to this dude's career, he won 20 games in a row at one point and looked like the most exciting jungler in the world. I'll just say flat out, thankfully, we were not in the trucker meta when it was time oh for Blank God. to be playing because- Wouldn't you be able to leave his it. house. Uh-uh, that would not be cool with that going around. Blank, yes, a very controversial one that you look at because a lot of people look to the disappointments, look to where he failed for T1 or needed to have someone else come in and be that savior for the team for that run type of situation, forgetting a lot of the work that was done everything in between those type of moments to get to that point in time blank is absolutely someone that was for a large part of his career i'm cautious in saying this very dependable for t1 for someone like faker and of course it all comes to then until when you aren't dependable enough for t1 for faker is really where we see that run and that changing of the guard 
4-T1 in that jungle position, but it should not be forgotten as you laid out that incredible start and everything that happened in between up until that end for Blink. And I know, again, the second half of his career is recency bias, what people kind of have with him. But 2016 spring, through to MSI, through a lot of worlds, really, this guy was one of the most exciting players, not just jungler, not just LCK, but in the entire world to see. He was doing things on Lee Sin that nobody was doing at the time. That is one of those things that is important to remember when you're talking about this type of player and looking back through the game and the stats and the lens that it is and understanding how the game of League of Legends has evolved and what the, especially the jungler position is capable of and is required to do, relied upon by the team and all these type of things. You go back in time, you look what Blank was doing, how he was competing for T1. And of course, as you said, pretty much if you can make that cutoff of 2016, you're looking at one of the most legendary players of that time, of that era of League of Legends. Of course, as we know, the career goes a little bit further than that. It changes the way that you're viewing it type of thing. Now that all aside, again, in this type of list, separating it in on the T1 side, I, I believe someone like Blank deserves his flowers for this time. One of the dudes who he was splitting time with in 2017, one of the greatest junglers of all time, Peanut comes to SKT in 2017 to make this dubbed super team. And much like Blank, we seem to remember how Worlds ended for SKT. Peanut's a liability. He's washed. Why did they sign this guy? But uh, all this guy did was make at least finals in every single event in 2017. And Spring and MSI, we were looking at this SKT roster saying, my God, this might be the best version of them we've ever seen. It was crazy going through that 2017 year, that time for T1 and realizing the roller coaster that that year is, of course, with just such a drastic dip in that 3-0 to Samsung at the end of the year, you forget about all the amazing rides that you had all the way through, of course, the LCK title. And then you're looking through again at MSI and that performance that he's putting through, especially on that signature Lee Sin pick, dominating, dismantling everybody that he came across. That was one of the best times that you're looking at for Peanut. A very uh, short and brief time with T1, but absolutely one that hit really hard when it hit. And unfortunately, just not able to hit at that last chance. And obviously, we always, we're not giving excuses, but the meta changes in 2017. But there's no question that there were times where Peanut exceeded expectations for him coming to an already stacked up lineup. Uh, of SKT at the time when Bengi was finally out as the starting jungler and Peanut obviously coming off the incredible Rocks Tigers year and you were saying how can you join SKT that's the team you were supposed to be groomed to defeat but again didn't finish below top two any major event so I don't know how you wouldn't be calling 2017 as a whole for Peanut a massive success the three spot on this list is another guy who was only there for one year, but boy, did he have an impact. Clid picked up both LCK titles in 2019, the revamp year for SKT, and at the biggest events of the year, both MSI and Worlds, most people were rating this guy as the best jungler and a top three player in the world. And I think one of the things is it's, you know, it's actually... It works out really great here, moving from Peanut towards Clid in this type of list to demonstrate the differences and where, why Clid accelerates to this third uh, spot on this type of list. The stability that he offered during his time for T1, whether it was about getting, you know, uh, surviving any of the pressures that you would have had with other these big threats at the time, or making sure that T1's getting off that runway. You're getting that damage, that power in the bottom lane. Faker's gonna have that type of role to play in the game. Clid was the one facilitating that and making sure that a lot of that was able to get off the ground with reliability throughout that period of time. You look back, just talking about Peanut, we had the highs and the highs and the lows, lows of making sure how the how that year ended. I don't think we reached that stable peak, that expected consistency of excellency that you did achieve with Clid in the Jungle 4T1 during that time. And there was never really a dip where you were saying, you know, Peanut towards Worlds, as we just mentioned, you're like, ah, he's not quite up to that world-class level. Clid was there even in the series that they were dropping a G2 at both MSI um, and at the World Championship. I, you weren't really looking at Clid individually as underperforming. No, and I think since really, you know, obviously going through these eras, these peaks of that position for T1, 
I think outside of the era of Bengi and Blank, that combination of that blanket duo, you didn't have that type of you know consistency, that type of reliability in the jungle where you could really trust him to get the job done, to be that impact player, to play at his very best when the stage and the lights were the brightest and biggest. That was one of those things that Clint absolutely also brought to the table for T1, one of those ones where you really wanted them to re-sign, to re-continue this type of path for them. Of course, Clint goes his separate ways, and we all know how history turns I, out in that I, kind of I situation. I think he needed more than a year on T1 to, you know, get the yeah. coma belt and maybe focus a little more on the rift that, as opposed to... Certainly a whole separate conversation to be had. But in this type of one, in this type of lens, and focusing in on the T1 era, there is no question about the level of consistency and stability that he provided for this team with his own play and as well as what he viewed the game with. Now we're into the big boys. The top two, where who you're putting top two is easy. It's obvious. I will accept arguments for either way in the positions that you're putting them in. But in that number two spot is owner who has gotten his share of flame, maybe right after blank because expectations were so high for this guy. But also individually, talent-wise, mechanically, the highest rated jungler on a list of stacked individual talent. But the highs that we have seen owner, even when T1 wasn't winning titles, he's now been here three years basically with T1. Individually, absolutely, astronomically world-class. I don't think there's a combination that you can come up with from this list that equals out to what owner is and what he exactly offers for T1 with this three-headed monster of his playmaking, his creativity, and his mechanical skill. All three of them combined are what makes him this ferocious monster to deal with in that jungle position. And one of these ones that is so lethal when he's on that same page, when he is on connection and communication with the team and everything is going right. We've seen him with a bit of this, a bit, a bit more of a dip than I think anybody would really have expected from a player of his caliber. When Faker was out of the lineup, we've seen the impact of having Faker in the lineup. We've heard from other players on this, you know, magnificent T1 roster. And a lot of them that you're saying, giving all these praise to, they're all pointing their fingers back to owner and saying, he's the spark. He's the one that makes it happen. He's the one that enables me to come up with this thought and go through this type of play. A major part of the revitalized success of the T1 organization. And in such a stacked mechanical roster that has been the owner era of T1, more often than not, he is the guy who you watch anyone watching through some of the streams for T1, they're going, owner, what is this guy doing? Oh my, owner, he's so, he's a genius. There's so many plays that no one else would see that owner can execute. And Kyria, the guy that everybody talks about with playmaking on T1, he says that's the guy. Owner is the guy that unlocks it for me, that lets me play with that type of confidence. A big part of that one, himself individually, some big plays just, of course, at this last world championship. Big time match against JDG. Can't be forgetting some of the moves that he had on that rel. Flashing the Ash arrow. Oh, it is so good. Owner, there's only the only way I look at it right now when we're talking about him is just more time. He needs more results for this T1 organization and the way that things are going, the expectation is those results are going to be pretty damn good. I mean, 2023, he had the reverse peanut and blank. He was struggling <laughs> throughout the LCK season and the level up was massive at World, so much so that he became the best jungler at the whole event when he was looking nothing like that throughout the entire LCK split. So all this praise and accolades for this dude. How is he not number one? We've still got to put respect on the only other player to win three world championships. It is the jungle itself, the right hand of God, Bangi, the savior for T1 and SKT in those Rocks Tiger series in 2016. This guy was one of the OG pioneers of LCK jungling, still deserves that respect. Another year, an owner probably takes this spot, but for now, we're still putting Banky. Yes, the 2024 run it back for T1 is going to be putting some serious threat into Bengi at number one for the junglers. Yes, rolling off an incredible history, an incredible run in his career alongside Faker is the big part of it all the way through. I think a lot of people, when they hear that, they kind of dismiss him as just this pawn that was there with Faker. And when it really is almost equal parts, if not at other times, 
more valuable from Vengi and what you were getting from him when you look back at those T1 at that T1 dynasty carving out those championships, the role that he played, of course, in such a demanding position, one that was even back then going through the changes quite drastically year after year, able to stay on top, able to be that impactful, reliable, dependable, trustworthy friend for Faker and for the rest of Team One. And listen, I, I don't believe in when people were saying this, but the whole 2017 to 2021-ish era where Faker and SKT weren't showing up as big on that international stage, that big as in actually winning these events, people were legitimately saying, ah, maybe Faker can't win without Fangy. And it's that's exactly it. And that's not meant to be any type of disrespect to someone like Faker. That was just more so about how much people believe in the impact that someone like Van Geek could provide. That clutch factor is also something you got to be looking at because I think a lot of the guys that we've talked about on this list have various levels of that clutch factor. I think someone like owner that we just talked about has had that clutch factor, has leveled up for T1 in that capacity. He's still got some room to grow if you want to be just as clutch as your boy Van Geek was for Faker and for that T1 dynasty. What's maybe most interesting to take note of on these junglers going forward. You already got Tom and Banky who have been coaches for T1. I wouldn't be shocked if guys like Cuz and Peanut when they retire are also going to be stepping into a coaching role with T1. The jungler, man, they see it all. They have to deal with everything from all the other players. Absolutely makes them in to that solidified, uh, solidified coaching position that we have seen so many of these legends become. And yeah, you're right. Players like Cuz, like Peanut, I could absolutely see that path for them in the future. But let's not jump to any any haste with that right now. My boy's still playing in the LCK. We still see this T1 lineage infect the rest of the LCK. Again, there's no other team that you can do rankings like this for a single role and have all these icons in the scene who have since played for multiple teams or played for multiple teams before that. That, again, just speaks to the decade-plus-long history of T1 and SKT as the greatest organization in League of Legends. But that is it. For today on League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for joining us, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.